the Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. Hello, my name is Richard Purden. I'm with the Ohio State University Extension. I am the Ag and Natural Resources ed Educator for Adams County and the Community Development Educator for Adams County, Ohio. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. So for this episode of the Southern Ohio Farm Show, we're going to be talking about some Super Bowl related facts, but specifically here for this segment, we have Pamela Sherritt, who is our OSU Extension Specialist for Turf Grass, and she will be talking about some of the factors that go into getting the Super Bowl field ready uh, for, for play uh, this year. And specifically, we're going to be talking about Raymond James Stadium in Tampa Bay, Florida, where the Super Bowl will be held this year. So we'll talk about how these turf grasses are grown and how they're interchangeable throughout the systems in the NFL and also in the collegiate level as well. So Pam, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself a little more here if you would like and give us more background on some of your work and then we can dive into the topic. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the specialist for uh, Ohio State. My, my area of expertise is sports turf. So I have colleagues that deal in golf course management and I do the football fields, the baseball fields, the soccer fields, anything that's not golf. So um, I visit high schools and parks and rec around the state and give advice on how to manage those turf grass systems. That's a part of my job. And then I teach um, a basic plant science class and a couple of sports turf management classes. So um, really excited that the Super Bowl is coming up. Uh, this is a big, a big thing for the groundsmen and, and groundswomen around the country. Um, what's really cool about the Super Bowl is they have a Super Bowl team and it's led by a guy called George Toma. He is 91 years old and he's been preparing every single game field since the beginning, every single Super Bowl field has been prepared and painted by George Toma. Um, so he's a turf guy that used to be uh, the head groundskeeper at the uh, Kansas City um, Chiefs. And uh, so he, what they do is George heads that team up and he'll invite the groundskeepers from the teams that are playing. So the Chiefs will be there, the groundskeepers from the Chiefs will be there and uh, the Tampa grounds guys will obviously be there. He brings it all together. Um, and then they have they have a student. They pick a student from a turf grass school. We've actually had a, an Ohio State student go down one year. Um, Zach Avers was our student that did it one year. He got to go down and prepare the field with that team. So it's a big deal in the turf industry. Um, this is the first year it's actually being played on a field where one of the teams plays year round. So that's that's new for this year. It's a natural grass field. Um, in turf, we have in turf grass management, we have natural grass fields um, and then we have synthetic fields. So in Ohio Stadium, our grass is artificial grass or synthetic turf. Um, and then Tampa Bay is natural grass. But what they've done at the end of the NFL playing season, they took that grass out and they brought in brand new grass uh, specifically for the Super Bowl. And whether they keep that grass after the Super Bowl, I, I don't know if that's their plan right now. Um, but I'd like to share, I'd like to share um, pictures from one of the Twitter accounts that I follow in relation to the Super Bowl. So this is, um, this is the sod that's, that's brought in last week. It comes on these big rolls and you can see that the sod is very thick. They call it thick cut sod. So it's probably two, two inches thick. It's extremely heavy, so they have to have special equipment to harvest the sod at the sod farm and bring it into the stadium. Um, this sod is 18 months old. So 18 months ago, this sod farm in Georgia um, seeded Bermuda grass, which is a southern grass. Uh, they seeded the Bermuda grass and they've grown it for 18 months. And then because Bermuda grass um, goes dormant in winter, it doesn't like the cold or the low light levels, so it goes dormant. They've overseeded it with a cool season grass, which is called perennial ryegrass. So this grass is actually two types of grass. It's got a base of Bermuda grass, which is very thick. 
it has stolons and rhizomes that inter intertwine like this so you can have you know a, a 300 pound football player digging his cleats in and that sod won't move because it's so strong and then to make it look green they've seeded perennial ryegrass into it so um so it's it's got that it's got that strength uh, the sheer strength that you need for football and it's got the color and you can you can stripe it with a mower and make it look great so they brought these rolls in last week um this is them putting the sod down you can see i mean look how thick that sod is um the reason it's so thick is that you can play on it straight away so they'll put this sod out on the field they will um maybe top dress it with some sand just to try and get those seams the, the sod seams tight um and then they'll water it and they'll mow it they'll stripe it up they'll paint all their logos on it and it's playable it's ready uh, it doesn't move because it's so heavy and so thick so again you can see um this is how thick it comes in they can literally get it out in in like one and a half days they can have this sod down and playable and there it is ready for the game uh, so they'll paint their logos on it. George will be in charge of making sure it looks perfect uh, on the day and um, and it's ready for play. All right. That's very interesting, Pam. And, you know, as you think about this, they, if you had watched the national championship game, they had also held that game there as well. So how quick can they change these these grasses out in these different sides? Well, actually, that's a really that's a great question, because this is sort of a new thing that's happening in the industry. You know, the stadiums used to be like, think about Ohio, Ohio Stadium, you know, we'd have maybe 12 home games, right? Um, there might be a summer camp in there or something like that. But it wasn't they didn't used to be used very much. And now these stadiums, they class them as multi use, you know, it's, it's a venue. So they want, they want something in there every day, they want concerts, weddings, corporate events, uh, sporting events, championships, high school. I mean, they want to use them and and, re and generate revenue from these stadiums year round. So what some companies will do, what some of these sporting uh, companies will do is they'll have a synthetic field that they can play a multitude of sports on. And then if they need to put grass out, natural grass out. So for example, soccer, international soccer games has to be played on natural grass. They can bring that, they can cover the synthetic field with a geotextile fabric and then lay grass, natural grass on top and they can switch it out. So a few years ago um, in Ohio Stadium, which has synthetic turf, we hosted the Real Madrid PSG soccer game. And a sod company came in and they covered Ohio Stadium's field in geotextile. They put natural grass on. Uh, we mowed it, striped it, and watered it the day after. We played the game. There was 98,000 people at the game. And the day after, um, it was gone. They stayed up all night. Literally, the game ended at like 10 o'clock at night. The fans left the stadium. Uh, and then the, the sod removal people came in and took the sod out. And I went in the next day at, at midday, and you couldn't even tell that natural grass had been in there. It was all gone. Um, and it was a shame because we were hoping we could give it to a, a local high school or something because it was really nice grass. But you need that specialist equipment because the sod is so heavy. And so it went to it. They, they went they took it and they put it somewhere where it got composted. So now that we've had a chance to take a look at how this is done commercially, if we're wanting to look at more into this, Pam, and find some more information and details, where can we go to find these types of resources? Okay, so in the Department of Horticulture and Crop Science, we have a turf grass team and we uh, we have a series of things that we do. We we put out we have a weekly turf team times that we put out on social media uh, that usually starts in March and runs through the growing season. We have fact sheets on Ohio line. Um, we have websites, we have social media accounts, we put on conferences um, and with us being an extension service also, you know, if, if a local high school has questions or wants a visit they, they can call the turf team and one of us can go out and visit you know if they have problems with weeds or a certain insect problem or they just want generic advice on you know my football field's worn away and uh, i've got no grass down the middle what can i do um they can they can call any one of us on the extension team and we can we can help so um i can sh i can share those those resources with with you 
Great, thanks. And we can, again, we'll have those links and websites available for viewing as well. And Pam, that brings up another question for me as we're talking about that. Uh, if, if these are damaged or if you are intending to keep these for a longer period of time, maybe more so than what the NFL is intending to do, how long can we keep one of these on our field uh, if we're caring for it and watering it? We talked about that two inch thickness. How long can that support a viable grass or a viable sod in this point? So one of the things they have to do with that sod, in fact, with any sod, if you if you bring sod in to your lawn or a field or wherever, you're bringing in a soil that's not compatible really with what you have underneath. You can try and match it. So that sod that went in at Raymond James was grown on sand because it's going to be put on a sand root zone. So they're trying to make it compatible. Um, but you still have that layer. And so what they'll do over time is, is aerate that. They'll punch holes through the sod layer uh, as a way to try and get the roots to leave the sod layer and grow down into the underlying soil. So if they keep that sod at Raymond James, it'll be aerated aggressively, punched. They'll punch holes through it and they'll top dress it with sand, again, with the same material that's underneath. Um, and they'll mow it and water it and treat it like treat it like any other grass um, that can stay there indefinitely. Now I'd say NFL, um, like the Browns, they've typically switched out the middle of their fields that get worn away. They might switch that out once every two years, just between the hash marks. Um, but yeah, it, you know, overseeding, watering, feeding, if you take care of it, it, it will last several years. All right. Well, Pam, thank you for the discussion today. I know I learned a lot. That's very interesting. And who knew there were so many ways to incorporate different types of sods and turfs into just one athletic event. Good morning. We're now joined by Andy Wintling, who is the plant manager of Wilson Sporting Goods Football Factory in Ada, Ohio. Um, so can you tell us a little bit of history about the Wilson's process of uh, producing footballs. How long have they been making footballs and um, what's their relationship with the NFL? Yes, uh, so our relationship with the NFL goes back to 1941. We're the official football. This is our 80th year to be the official game ball for the NFL. We, uh, we moved to Ada in 1955. So we've been in this building since 55. Um, we process all the NFL game balls, uh, CFL, high school, college, youth footballs, and they're all genuine leather footballs. Great. Um, so how many does it take to work at your factory to keep production going? So we have just over 100 employees on the floor, and we're right around 135 total employees at the factory. Okay. And so how many how many footballs can you produce in a, a day or a year? What, what's your production yeah, so we, we, we target around two to 2,500 balls a day. Wow. So that's a, that's a big number. Yeah. I watched some of the, the YouTube videos that you recommended, and it's a really interesting process of how they're made. Can you describe that for us? Yeah. So, I'm, you know, I came here five and a half years ago. I was in automotive for 21 years. So everything was automated, um, robots, you know, there were cells. And I come here thinking well, it's just a football. Um, but after being here, you know, there's the, the pride and the passion and the craftsmanship it takes to make a, a foot by, by hand, right? I thought I'd walk in here and we could automate stuff. Um, there's some things we're, we're, we've done in five years, but you really kind of just leave it alone. It's the way they sew the football. It, it's a feel, how they push it through the machine um, from the time they cut it to the time they sew it and stamp it. And then it, obviously the turning process is very a very physical, violent process of getting the ball right side out. Um, so in lacing, right, everything's done by hand. So it's not just a football. There's so much passion that, that goes into making these footballs. And then with, with the technology today, um, we have sensors in the balls. So um, another reason I came here was to help design and develop how we put sensors in the ball. So it's come a long way, um, but, uh, it's it, just the way they do it by hand. And if you, you, know, if you can see the videos or if you get a chance to come for a tour, everybody's amazed to, to see how we actually make a football. Yeah, it, it's a, from what I could see in the videos, it's really a, an interesting process. It's very cool. Yes. So um, you mentioned that there's sensors in the ball. Can you tell us what those do? So, 
So I can. So I came here about five and a half years ago as the principal engineer. Uh, and obviously the last two and a half years I've been the plant manager. But when I came here, I, um, I came to help design and develop uh, bladders that have sensors in them. Uh, the NFL, and we have, Wilson has a sensor that's different than the NFL. The NFL sensor is made by Zebra. Uh, it's for tracking purposes only. So it tracks the ball on the field. So if you ever go to or listen to an NFL game, they'll say next gen stats brought to you by next gen stats. They track the players on the field too. So they have sensors in their shoulder pads. They know how fast they run, how high they jump, what routes they run, but they didn't know why they were moving, right? Because there was no sensor in the ball. So now that we have a sensor in the football, they can sense the location of that football and then all the players too. So um, that's been a huge, so the last four years we've been putting sensors into all the game balls and um, we will continue to do that. They can evaluate snap to catch the quarterback. The quarterback then, how, how long did he have the ball before he threw it? So how quick did he process the defense? And then how quick did it get to the receiver? Um, so all those things are calculated and they calculate the guy's speeds, how fast they react to things so they can coach the guys up too. So um, we're not, like I said, it's not just a football anymore. This, the, we're, we're at the leading edge of the technology and developing sensors and um, pushing that envelope. So it's a really neat project to be part of. That is, that is interesting. Um, so the, the bladder that's in the ball, it's, um, it's a, it's not a, it's a plastic bladder, correct? It's not. It's, it's polyurethane. We, we make all of our bladders here at the factory and then we can encapsulate that sensor during that process. Okay. Um, so what is the, the regulation air pressure that is supposed to be in one of the balls? So, so the, the rules are 13 PSI is nominal, and then you have plus or minus 0.5 for your tolerance. So 12.5 to 13.5 uh, PSI is, is what they go out of here. And then the teams all have uh, something that we designed and developed here too is um, a machine that can that it, it, it detects back pressure. So when they put the needle in the football, the pressure that's in here pushes back to this machine and tells the computer uh, there's 12.7 PSI in here. So um, that was huge. You know, we, we, when the game balls go out of here, we use that same equipment, that equipment's being used at all the stadiums, at all the team facilities. So we have, it's, it's all self calibrated and certified. So everything's good to go now. Um, but they do give them one PSI to, to move around in. So some guys like it a little bit, you know, at 12.7, somebody might like it 13.3. So they have some room and each quarterback's different. And then that equipment manager can tell that unit hey, I want 13 PSI in here or 13.3 and it takes it there. And then on game day, the referees check it again just before two hours before the game so that they know they're within spec. So all that stuff happens like two hours before a game. We have no idea that stuff's going on, but there's so many things going on behind scenes. It's crazy. That is, that's, there's a lot I'm sure that I don't know that I'm not aware about. So this, this is really interesting. <laughs> I've watched football a long time, but yeah, we learned a lot about the balls. <laughs> um, um, so we, we talk a lot on our program about agriculture. Um, and so can you tell us about the leather and um, kind of where it's sourced? What what's the process that it goes before it gets to your football? So all the cattle, you know, are raised in the Midwest in the US. <clears throat> some are grain fed and some are uh, uh, hay or grass fed. And you can tell um, I'm not a leather expert by any means, but you, we can kind of tell, hey, this cow was probably uh, grain fed because of the density of the hide. So um, all the cattle, again, they're all raised in the Midwest. They're, they're processed. The hides go to a, a leather tannery in Chicago called Horween uh, Leather. Um, they'll, they'll tan it there and they put a tack of fire in it for us. So as we brush this football, some of that tack will come to the surface and it makes it easier to grip or you know, more grippy. That's a technical term. <laughs> Um, so they, 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 then they will apply the pebble, they'll press it in with heat and pressure. And also if you get a, a Wilson game ball, if you look at it, there's little W's uh, stamped in here. A lot of people don't know that's, that's in there. It's a really cool feature. So they'll, they'll process that leather, send us the hides. We take those hides and we start cutting the, the actual individual pieces, the individual four panels, and then we start processing it there. Okay. Um, so 
are there different features that you apply to different balls? I, you know, I saw that that one that you have, it, it looks like it's got some Super Bowl information. Yep. So are there different patterns that you have? Yes. So there's five size footballs we make uh, anyway from a K2, which is a very small ball would fit my palm. Right. And then we have, I would call it midget football or your fourth, fifth and sixth graders. And then okay. junior high is another level up, which is seventh and eighth grade. Then you have high school and college that play with the same size football. And then you have the professional football, which is bigger in circumference by a quarter inch. So it is a little bit bigger to throw an NFL game ball versus a college ball. So this ball has no stripes. Um, but we have high school that have a, a stripe halfway around the ball. High school and college play with this, this game ball here. So that's the difference. But, and that's what the NFL likes is their ball is different, right? They want to set themselves apart from amateur to professional. So this is their football. And plus, it's a little bit bigger here in the circumference. So that's, okay. the, that's just the difference. We make red leather and orange leather footballs. And it's your preference if you prefer to play with red. You know, we can make the same football in red. So we offer many different SKUs. We offer a lot of customization. Like this is actually my high school, Terry High School. So we can put a C on there for you. We can put color foils in here to really make it pop, right? It really looks cool. And we yeah. can change the lace color too. We can go black, white, blue, red, green. So a lot of customization. I come here, they used to make like 700,000 footballs a year and they used to make a bunch of one kind. Well, today everybody wants their own football, right? So right. we don't make as many, but we make a lot more different kinds. Everybody wants a different kind of stamp, a foil stamp or different colors. So customization has come a long way. And uh, if you go to the website, you can, you can even purchase baby balls or uh, we've had people get engaged you know, will you marry me football? Uh, we've done everything, ha happy Father's Day, those kind of things. So um, we <laughs> offer a lot of customization online, but uh, back to, to the question, as far as different kind of footballs, we make about five different kinds, sizes, and then you can customize it from there. That's great. Um, so how many, you said when we talked earlier this week that you were shipping the NFL Super Bowl balls, how many balls do they get in their shipment for that game? So each team gets 108 footballs. So they get 54 for practice and then they bring 54 to the game. Okay. And there's kicking balls on top of that that we have to provide. So right around 230 balls total for the Super Bowl. So how do you ship that to make sure that it gets there on time? <laughs> <clears throat> so we, uh, we do a lot of preparation before Sunday's championship game. We have a lot of balls processed but we have to wait and then obviously add these last two team names here. So Sunday night at 10.30 or 10 o'clock when the games are over, we can now start stamping those two team names. So we'll do that till about 4 a.m. and then come back in at 6 a.m. with a different crew and continue that process. And then by Monday afternoon, we're shipping balls to the teams. And then Tuesday we finish up and we're done by Tuesday. They have their balls by Wednesday. So yesterday, both teams had all their game balls and they can start prepping them for the game and going through and deciding which ones they want to use for practice and which ones for game. So it's an interesting process. That is, that's really cool. Um, so is there anything else that you think we ought to know to be able to get before the game that two people ought to be looking for when they watch the game to know about your footballs? Um, What's really cool is, you know, the stamping process, you know, it's got to look nice and clean and, you know, we want it to pop when it's on the field. Obviously, we, we want to know that it's made by Wilson Sporting Goods too. Um, but what's, you know, unique about this game ball is it's it's the, the, the leather and where we, you know, in the hide, the, at, the, at the backbone area, it's more dense. So if you can imagine like if, if you, were to wrap around yourself, the belly area is more stretched, right? It's got more wrinkles. We stay away from that area. And we focus more up here in the backbone and get these panels from that area. And it re retains the pebble better and it makes a better looking football. And um, the, the quarterbacks really want to focus on um, their grip. Obviously, if it feels good in their hands, they're gonna play good. So we, we try to take care of that for them as we process these footballs. Um, these quarterbacks are very particular 
So um, we get we get some comments back that uh, they weren't happy or it, you know, hey, these were good and those kind of things. So um, it's just a neat process to go through, and then to see them on the field that 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 night, you know, it uh, really makes you proud. I'm sure, and I, I can tell what, that it takes a lot of work, and there's a lot of hands that touch each ball. Um, some of the videos you you sent um, highlighted a lady who'd worked in the factory for a long time, and she got to go to some of the games. Is anybody getting to go this year? So this year we are taking a year off. Um, obviously, up till this year, I've been to two myself. The last two that I've been the plant manager, we go, we go, we have the experience where we have a booth. You can come by and purchase a football. We'll make it for you right there. Uh, very popular. We work for two weeks up till the Super Bowl, and then we, the crew we get to take, we, we take them to the game. So it's a really nice, um, nice little perk for the group. Uh, goes with a lot of work, though, right? We a lot of long hours, a lot of 12 hour days while we're down there or wherever we're at. So it's not like a vacation, um, but it's a nice reward after we're done working. And um, But uh, yeah, this year we're taking the year off just with everything going on. Hopefully, next year we can get get back into swinging things if we get some normalcy back and it may affect us and how we go about it how many people we take do we change how we do it um i don't know yet but um yeah this year unfortunately we're gonna not get to go so actually we'd be leaving today if we were going i wouldn't be talking to you <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out for you yeah <laughs> We, well, we I'm sorry actually... I don't get to go, but we're, we're <laughs> glad that you talked to us today. <laughs> so, so um, are do you just solely make footballs in your facility, correct? We, we only produce genuine leather footballs here, but what we do do is all inflates. So volley, soccer, and basketball, if they're customized, they come to us. So they're made overseas, they're shipped to Nashville. If we have orders, we order from Nashville, they ship us the balls. We can laser them, we can direct print, and we can put a decal like this football on your team basketball, volleyball, or soccer ball. So all inflates that are customized actually come through ADA. So it's a, it's a nice little extra thing that we can do. And then I'm not sure if you're aware of this, um, but for 2021, 22, we're the official basketball, the NBA. So we're gonna have two professional sports under Wilson's umbrella. And all those NBA basketballs are going to come through Wilson and Ada to be customized. So every team basketball that goes to the Cavaliers or to the Heat or the Bulls actually come through these doors here and we got to break them in, do a process and then laser on them and stuff. So that's really, that, that launches this year in April, right around that time frame. So the WNBA, the NBA, and then the G League, all those basketballs will come here. So we won't make them again, but we will do the prep process, uh, customize all those balls here. So it's a nice extra feature for us. Our next guest on the Southern Ohio Farm Show is Bobby Carpenter, who is the host of 97.1 The Fans, The Morning Juice. You might've known Bobby when he played for Ohio State, but he's also had a 10 year career in the NFL. So Bobby, um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight about your career and you've played in a lot of stadiums. What, what are things that might influence what we're seeing on Sunday? Uh, well, when you look at the stadiums, number one, you're going to look at, you know, regionality, where is it located within the country? That's going to determine what type of grass it has, if it has grass versus a synthetic turf. And it's, I think there's more synthetic turf fields now than there are grass. And obviously most of the dome stadiums are synthetic, although a couple do have the rollout grass, but when you do that, one of the things like football is such a, it's, it's such a high velocity sport and the players on it are so large and you generally play it between the hashes and the NFL hashes are very tight. So you're on the same tight portions of the field over and over again. And that's why it gets so worn out. And so a lot of times what they'll do, you know, they, they'll aerate it and they'll fill it with sand to help firm it up. And the, the, the game will be played in Tampa. And so one of the aspects of that is that that field down there is notoriously soft. It's very soggy year round. There's a lot of humidity. They have a lot of fog. And because of that, you see a lot of players slip. So they'll generally go to their uh, seven stud cleat, which is a little bit thicker. It's going to give you a little bit better, uh, better grip. But some of the guys, they don't really like those shoes. They don't feel quite as well as some of the general molded ones. But it's 
it, it, it can play an impact because you watch film and everybody says, I won't slip, I won't slip. And then all of a sudden you see guys sliding around. And so with Tampa Bay being the first team to actually play in their home stadium for the Super Bowl, you're going to see maybe a little bit of an advantage for them with that regard because it's something that they're, they've are they experienced. They play on it eight times a year as opposed to just coming in you know, once a year or maybe once every two or three years to see what it's like. Right. So have you ever played yourself at the Raymond James Stadium in Tampa? I did. We opened up there my fourth year when I was playing in Dallas, and then I played again there my fifth year when I was in Detroit. And I think that that sums it. I think that's all of it. Early in the season, we opened up the season there in Dallas, so it was very hot. It was early in the year. And, you know, it was humid, but the sun was beating down. It was 90 degrees. So, you know, it was it was exhausting, obviously. I just get – get make sure you're properly hydrated but the field was in really good condition later in the year i played there i think it was in december so it'd be a similar climate right now to what you're experiencing uh my next year in detroit and it was much different it was uh it was a muddy field it was it was you could feel the moisture in in the uh in the grass and it had been resodded at that point so obviously it hadn't pulled it fully you know rooted up and so there was some sliding a little bit that was going on so you know, it's a unique stadium. They got a sweet pirate ship there. When the home team scores, you know, Tampa Bay, the Bucs, they fired off. I don't know if they'll let them do that for the Super Bowl or not because it's technically supposed to be a neutral field. But it's a, it's a pretty cool place to play. It's very unique. And, you know, hopefully the weather is good down there because you hate to see rain and during a game. Absolutely. So uh, even though they want a neutral uh, location to play the game, this is the first year that the Super Bowl has been playing in one of the team's home stadium uh, do you think that will impact the performance any well you know the familiarity with the field I think that that'll be a big piece given that it's kind of unique and it's uh it's a soft grass field so I think that will help but then also just the consistency of routine that that's a big piece a lot of professional athletes you know people call them superstitious many of them are just so rooted in their routine it's, it's deeply rooted in their mind that they don't like to be uncomfortable and be outside of it and so that's that's a big part of how you feel and Normally you would get down there a week before the game and it's kind of like a bowl game in college. You have your media day and you go through some stuff. And so they'd be heading out, you know, this weekend to fly down there probably on Saturday or Sunday. Well, this year is completely different due to COVID. Tampa has been there the whole time because that's where they live. That's where they reside. Kansas city is not coming in until ultimately, I think Saturday, Friday or Saturday, right before the game. And so they won't get a chance to have the walkthroughs on the field and, you know, the routine has been broken. And even though they were in the Super Bowl last year, this is going to be a kind of a Super Bowl unlike any other, just given the unique circumstances, uh, circumstances that they're dealing with. Well, COVID has certainly made challenges for everybody this year, it seems like. Um, so since the schedule has been altered, how will that change how they prepare for the game for the team that's uh, grappling? Well, normally you get, all, it won't change really that first week. The first week, you know, the guys have a day or two off and that's when they're trying to get all their ticket situation figured out, their stuff with their families figured out, everything taken care of. And then you have usually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, good days of preparation and practice, you know, start to put some stuff in and they get guys that are injured, get their body healthy. And, you know, then you obviously you travel out to the site in, in years past and then you have your big media day, which was always a circus. And this year they didn't have that. It was, you know, it was, it'll be a Zoom media day coming up, I think, Monday or Tuesday. It's not going to be near the same. You know, people from all over the world, correspondents from everywhere. You know, people have all these different affiliations. They're wearing you know, costumes, asking crazy questions. And so I'm curious to see you know, how that's going to obviously play out because it won't be near as stressful or high pressure when you're just sitting in front of a computer screen. You've got a boxes of people as opposed to sitting at a podium for you know, maybe two, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. So and the transit to and from. So that'll be a, that'll be a lot different. And then you, know, you go out there and then normally you start to finish up your game planning and install, you get everybody greased up and you go. And so Kansas city will be doing all that remotely. They won't get really a chance to really feel the climate. Not that that's the biggest thing in the world, but it does help when you've been in the same area and you've, you've experienced breathing through the humidity and you're coming from a cold weather environment in the winter. And maybe you haven't been a part of that for a while. So there will be some unique challenges that COVID is, you know, going to hinder the ability, I think, to get for these guys to prepare in the way that they normally would. So one of the topics that the gentleman at Wilson Sporting Goods was telling us was that there are sensors in the balls and in the shoulder pads 
that the players are wearing. And can you tell us kind of where this technology is going in the future? Where do you think that it will end up? Well, the, the sensor technology is something that people have been kind of clamoring for forever. You look at the NFL, I mean, it's a $12 billion a year business. And we still use two essentially broomsticks with a uh, chain link, uh, chain link uh, cord in between to measure 10 yards out. And it depends on the spot and is everything re- you know, correct. And so the, the argument has been made for a while now, you know, why don't they put some sort of sensor in the ball so you can see actually where the ball goes? Is it a first down? Is it a touchdown? So there's sensors in the balls right now. They're not using them actively during game day. They have sensors in the shoulder pads. And I believe a lot of those sensors can measure, you know, force, impact, the speed at which guys are traveling. And so the ball does that. And they've been gathering this data. And I think they're trying to develop, you know, a large enough sample size to where they'll be able to, you know, properly integrate it and understand, you know, how to implement some of that stuff on the field because they, they have the they have the technology now and they're beginning to use it in other sports. And so I think the NFL just wants to make sure that this is perfected before they, you know, risk their $12 billion baby and in, in putting something out there that may not be ready to go. So would every player on the field have one of these sensors in their shoulder pads or is it only certain ones? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think they probably would end up doing every one of them. I, I doubt it would be cost prohibitive. And if it's not size prohibitive, which if it was, they wouldn't do it anyway. So small sensors, I would imagine they'll start getting them in everybody's shoulder pads moving on just so they can continue to collect data. And then I think you'll see a push over the next two or three years to start using some more of these, you know, technology based systems in implementation and governing of the game, because it's, it's such a widely popular game and they don't want it to be use the term corrupted, but maybe improperly managed due to your human error. So we have two, good teams that are coming to the Super Bowl and they're they both have highly qualified athletes what are things that we what are we going to be looking at this weekend and what what are your thoughts on the game well I think uh number one you know like you mentioned both these teams are good they've got one quarterback that's a surefire hall of famer day gets day gets done and another guy that you know he might be as well and they're you know heck about 16 17 years apart in age so you've got both ends of the spectrum although Pat Mahomes is very experienced. You know, he's played in big games, played in a Super Bowl. He's won a Super Bowl. He's won an MVP. You know, Tom's won six, and he's won multiple MVPs. You know, heck of a player. So, you know, in looking at this, I try to eliminate those guys and say, what does the rest of the team look like? Both of them have really talented offenses. The only problem, I think, for Kansas City, defensively, they're a little slow. Or not, uh, T- Tampa Bay, I think, is a little bit slower on defense, which may come back to bite them. You know, in the defensive backfield, Kansas City, you know, they've got some inconsistencies. They take some risks. They'll try to pressure Tom Brady. And historically, their defensive coordinators had success against him. He was the Giants defensive coordinator when they won uh, their first Super Bowl. So I think, you know, his defense could give him trouble. But ultimately, I think it's going to come down to who has the football last and has enough time to score. Either one of these guys with two minutes to go and a touchdown tie uh, wins it. I'm going to take whoever has the ball at the end of the game. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing you on this weekend. And uh, thanks for being on the show today. My pleasure, Brooke. Thanks for having me on.